Hi everyone, this video is an introduction into evolution by natural selection for AP Biology. I want us to start by looking at a population of members of the same species that live in the same area that can interbreed. For our purposes here, we're going to look at rabbits. Some of them are green, some of them are white. In this adorable population, which do you think is going to be most likely to survive and why? Let's find out. As they interbreed, this trait is co-dominant, so you can see we have some all white bunnies, some all green bunnies, and some green and white bunnies. They interbreed, and oh, here comes a predator. Who is this owl going to eat? Well, the owl's likely going to be eating the white rabbits. They're a lot easier to spot, and they don't blend into the background like the green ones. So now that they have been eaten, we're left with one entirely green bunny and two mostly green bunnies. They were able to avoid getting eaten by the owl. What's going to happen when this population reproduces now? Well, we're probably going to see fewer white bunnies. That trait is still there. We still have green and white bunnies that will have offspring that are white. But the owl still hungry. Owl's going to continue to eat, and the owl will continue to eat the ones that are easiest for it to see. But seasons change. The environment's getting colder. Turns out that that white fur is thicker and helps survive in the cold, whereas the green fur, even though it helps you blend into a green environment, is rather thin. What do you think is going to happen to our rabbits now? Well, the green one's probably not going to make it through the cold, so you'll probably see an increase in the white trait appear. This is what we mean when we talk about natural selection. Natural forces, such as predators or change in the environment, are selecting for fit traits. If you have traits that help you survive in a specific environment, you're more likely to reproduce and pass them down. If you have traits that don't help you survive, you're likely to pass away before you reproduce. This will cause an increase in the chances of an organism with that fit trait to survive and reproduce. So as I go through the history of the theory of evolution with you, please keep in mind this is the primary mechanic. Environments change, predators change, whatever traits help you survive and reproduce, those get passed on. Whatever traits don't, don't. So how can scientists explain life? Within science, scientists form scientific theories and test them to see if they're able to explain natural events, if there's evidence supporting them, and if they're able to predict future events. In the realm of biology, questions we want to answer with our scientific theory are things like, why is life so diverse? Why so many different species on Earth? Why does it appear that species are perfectly adapted to their environments? For example, this polar bear is pretty well situated for living in the Arctic environment with its thick fur and white fur color. And why is it that some species are alive today? We refer to that as being extant, but other species are extinct. What could explain why some make it and some don't? So before we look at the discovery of natural selection, we want to know what scientists thought at the time before this discovery. According to 18th century scientists, species have always existed and don't change through time. Fossil discoveries started to slowly convince scientists that maybe you know, species can go extinct, that there are no other members. Before these discoveries, people thought that a fossil was just of a species we hadn't found alive yet. Scientists believe that Earth is millions of years old and could change over time. And Gregor Mendel was born during this time, but his work was largely ignored until the 20th century. So from the perspective of the discovery of natural selection, we're not thinking in terms of genetics until we revisit Mendel's work later on. So let's look at Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was born in 1809 and lived until 1882. He was a British naturalist, and this was a time before having the distinctions of a biologist or a chemist or a physicist. Naturalist meant you were interested in questions regarding the natural world. He's the one who proposed the idea of evolution by natural selection and was able to quite convincingly collect evidence to support these ideas. A lot of the evidence that he gathered and the pinnacle of his thinking came from his voyage on a ship called the HMS Beagle. He was invited to travel around the world at only age 22 on a ship captained by Rome captain by Robert Fitzroy. Now why would some 22 year old be invited to come on board? Well when you're taking a voyage around the world at this time, you're spending months if not years at sea. You get bored. 
You want someone entertaining to have conversations with along that voyage. So it was common for people who were very well educated or naturalists like Darwin to be offered voyage on a ship in exchange for providing education and such resources on the voyage. During this, he made many observations, and it was particularly when traveling down the South American coastline and islands off of Ecuador called the Galapagos, where he had his major breakthroughs. As he sailed, he wanted to answer questions like, why is life so diverse? Why are there so many different species? And why are members of each species so different? Why are living things so well adapted to their environments? So as he traveled, he did what any good scientist would do, gathered evidence, and documented everything. He drew sketches of every single geological and living thing he encountered, and captured many specimens and mailed them back to England. When he got to the coast of South America, he noticed a succession of types, that there were armadillos native to the Americas, but most species were found in South America. He also noticed this, fossils of a very armadillo-like species. He wondered why should extinct armadillo-like species and living armadillos be found in the exact same continent? That's bizarre. It's the same environment, it seems. It's the same area. Why would one survive, be extant, but when the other goes extinct? He noticed this not only with armadillos, but with sloths. The, gi the fossils of giant ground sloths were found. Not a single one of them could be found alive, but modern sloths could be found. The wonderful relationship in the same continent between the dead and the living will throw more light on the appearance of organic beings on our Earth and their disappearance from it than any other class of facts. Darwin rightfully pinpointed this question being one that was central to be answered to explain the diversity and appearance of life. Why are some alive and some not? Along the voyage, they stopped at the Galapagos Islands, which are about 500 miles off the coast of Ecuador. And these islands provide a really unique insight into life and how it's changed over time. On these islands, Darwin found a lot of birds, collected a lot of specimens, and he thought each of them was their own species. That perhaps this one's a finch, that one's a sparrow, maybe a woodpecker or a warbler. But as he examined closer and closer all of the traits and particularly noticed the only one sparrow species in continental Ecuador, yet it appears there's many on the islands, he realized that this wasn't 14 different species of bird. It's actually one. It seemed that the ancestral species from Ecuador flew to the Galapagos Islands, and since each island has its own unique, rich environment, they began to deviate or differentiate from the mainland species. This was a unique way of thinking. How could one species of finches become so different from species today? What could have driven this if it's true that that one ancestral species is the origin of so many different varieties? Darwin started to think in terms of trees. Perhaps there's an ancestral species, that mainland finch, and then branching or descendant species from that mainland finch that have filled all of these different environments on the islands. The idea is we start with an ancestor, and changes branch out like branches on a tree. Such thinking in terms of life was revolutionary at the time. He noticed there was a correlation in changes based on the food source of the birds. That's the seed eaters branched from an early ancestor compared to the flower eaters compared to the insect eaters, but that all of them could be tracked back to a common ancestor from the American mainland. This idea of one ancestral species filling and changing over time niches on different islands or different areas in general is known as adaptive radiation. These species are adapting to a new environment and those changes radiate out from the ancestral species. He was able to determine this by the differences in the size of the beaks on the finches. When you look at a beak on a bird, keep in mind that might as well be the bird's hand. This is the primary tool that they're using to survive, to obtain resources to run their metabolism. If I were to get to an island that had flowers but no seeds, having a narrower beak to get into the flowers would increase my likelihood of surviving compared to having a large beak that doesn't fit in the flowers but can crack open nuts and seeds. Looking at that food source, it became readily apparent how species descended based on their beak size. 
So Darwin drew a lot of conclusion from these finches. He concluded that small populations of original South American finches landed on these islands. Every generation is diverse. Think about meiosis. Think about a generation of people your age. There are slight genetic differences between us all. Some are tall, some are short. That variation enabled individuals to gather food successfully if they had a beak that fit the food source in the island they were there. Over many generations, the populations of finches changed and their behaviors changed as well. And it was this accumulation of advantageous traits in the population that caused the emergence of different species. At the end of his voyage, Darwin returned with all of the artifacts and observations that he made and was determined to answer the questions, what can explain the diversity of life? Why are living things so well adapted to their environment? And why have some species become extinct when others survive? Science is never done in a vacuum. Darwin had his work and his observations that he collected from his voyage, but he wanted to also see what contemporary researchers and scientists were doing at the time. So it's important to understand three large ideas that influenced Darwin's work from two scientists and a social scientist during his time. Let's first look at the work of Hutton and Lyle. During Darwin's time, some people thought Earth was only thousands of years old, but that didn't answer the question how complicated, sophisticated, multi-layered rock layers could form. Think things like the Grand Canyon. We can see strata, different layers of rocks that couldn't be formed in only a thousand years. So Hutton proposed the idea that natural forces, such as rain, wind, heat, and cold, could actually change the shape of the Earth itself. If you give these forces millions of years instead of thousands of years, activities like erosion and weathering, water breaking away rock, or water freezing, expanding and chipping away rock, would be powerful enough to explain the rock formations we see now. Now, of course, we know now the Earth is billions of years old, not millions of years, but this idea was paramount in nature being the force that changes the world, considering how old the world is. Lyle, in his book of Principles of Geology, which we know Darwin read, argued that natural forces that are catastrophic, such as volcanic events or earthquakes, also contribute to the different geological forms we see on Earth. Does it happen rapidly within thousands of years? No, but given millions of years and today we know billions of years, these forces are powerful enough to change the landscape of Earth again and again and again. So from this, we know that Darwin learned that geologic changes physically shape the Earth, that the Earth-shaping processes that have occurred in the past are still happening today, volcanoes still erupt, and that Earth is millions of years old. Again, we know today it's billions of years. So imagining we're Darwin for a moment, he probably got this inference from their work. If Earth can change over long periods of time, couldn't life change as well? Another biologist during Darwin's time was Jean Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck, analyzing the same questions, also proposed an answer for how species can change over time and why they're so diverse. His answer was that living things change over time by the use and disuse of different body parts. For example, here you can see a male fiddler crab. A male fiddler crab is one small claw, one giant claw. The small claw is used for eating, for moving around. The big claw can't be used for any of that. The only thing that large claw does is go like this to flex to attract the mate. Now, how could a giant claw like that develop? According to Lamarck, an ancestral crab would have gone like this and their claw would have gotten a lot of bigger, a little bit bigger as a result of the physical activity it did. Their kids, in turn, would inherit that slightly bigger claw. And this would happen again generation after generation until you end up with an exaggerated claw. It's the use and disuse of a trait acquired during the life of an animal that is passed down. And that's what explains the diversity we see. Do you think that hypothesis is correct? Well, what you do in science is design an experiment. So let's do one for Lamarck's hypothesis. His hypothesis is that organisms pass down traits they acquire from the use of their bodies. So for example, a giraffe, it has to stretch to reach leaves at the top of a tree. So perhaps that stretching is getting passed down generation after generation, and that's why their necks are long. How could I experimentally see if this is true or not? Well, what I would do is I would take some short-necked giraffes, I would put them in an environment with a increasingly higher 
tree. I will wait multiple generations and see, well, does the stretching of the neck result in longer neck giraffes? Spoiler alert, it doesn't. Turns out that what we do during our lives is not inherited or passed down to the next generation. Only our genes are, but we didn't know about genetics at this time. So from the mark, though, Darwin likely saw, well, acquired traits cause species to change over time, perhaps. Maybe the use and disuse of organs could cause traits to appear or be disappeared, and acquired traits could be passed on to offspring. Darwin didn't agree, but this likely got Darwin to think about, well, how are traits passed down from one generation to another? How do they appear, and how do they go away, looking at extinct fossils and comparing them to today? Another pivotal work for Darwin was the work of Mathis. He was a social scientist concerned with population size. Looking at the hospital records throughout England, he's able to see how many people are born and how many people die. Typically, it was one person born for each person that died. Population stayed the same. But in 1787, Mathis realized that more people were actually being born than dying. He knows that there were two births for every one birth, then four, then eight. This caused him to panic. Why would more births and deaths be a problem? Well, there are only so many resources in any environment. All living things require food and space to survive. If too many of one organism exist, then limited food and space is going to limit the size of the population. The number of individuals will outpace the resources in space, causing individuals to die off. And Mathis was very concerned about this for the human population. Think about sea turtles as another example. They have about 110 babies per birth. That's a lot. Why are we overrun with sea turtles? Because scarce food and space limit populations. There are only so much food, there's only so much food available to these turtles, only so much space, and they're dealing with predation predators feeding on them as well. So it can be expected that nowhere near all those children are going to survive. So from Mathis, Darwin learned that food and space are limited that eventually population growth will exhaust all the resources available, and that plants and animals like the sea turtle produce thousands of offspring, but most of them die before hitting adulthood. So this got Darwin thinking, well, what determines which offspring survive, which ones reproduce, and how many of those that appear make it? Putting all of this together, synthesizing the work of other scientists and his observations, in 1859, Charles Darwin published his work in the entitled it On the Origin of Species. This is what proposed the theory of evolution by natural selection, or in general argued that species do change over long periods of time, and natural selection provides the mechanism of how they do that. Here are some examples that Darwin drew from in his work. He was preoccupied with looking at farmers. He felt, and he was right, that farmers had actually been doing what nature's been doing for thousands of years. For example, let's say a farmer wants to grow a really large cow. If you're a beef dairy farmer, you want that. The bigger your cow, the more profits you can make. So what these farmers would do is from the offspring of their best cows, they would select the largest and have those largest cows reproduce. And surprise, when you do that, more of the offspring are larger than they were in the previous generation. So farmers, again, would pick the largest cows, breed them together until they got franken cows. Now, this image is fake, but this is done to just emphasize the point that nature gives us random recombination and diversity. All of these cows are slightly different. What farmers have been doing is selecting or picking which of those traits out of that diverse pool are going to reproduce and therefore what genes are passed down. When humans select or choose which offspring mate, we are artificially selecting what traits make it to the next generation. This is what we call artificial selection. It's a process of humans breeding organisms with desired traits. And Darwin spends a good amount of time in his book discussing this phenomenon that we've been doing for a long time. Some examples of artificial selection you may or may not be familiar with. An ancestral mustard plant has actually been selectively bred to produce things you eat today like Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi. It's all been done by farmers selecting specific traits in the plant and breeding them over generation after generation to get the desired trait. This is how we've gotten man's best friend as well. 
all currently existing species of dog are actually descendants from wolves. We formed a close bond with them and we've been selectively breeding them based on the traits we want to see in the offspring. Giving you dogs that kind of look like a wolf, like a husky, to exaggerated things like a pug or a dachshund or a basset hound. Remember from math is that populations are limited by food and space. So if I have three rabbits here but only enough grass to feed one, one of them's going to be able to eat the grass and the others are going to perish. This fact is referred to as the struggle of existence or struggle for existence. Living organisms have to compete with each other because resources such as food, space, and water are limited. This struggle is what is in part driving how species change. The term fitness is often used when explaining evolution. Fitness does not mean how athletic you are or how many miles you can run. All it means is the ability of an individual to survive in a specific environment. All of these organisms are undergoing the struggle of existence. Consider this example of an owl and some mice. You'll see the background is black. These mice are struggling to get food and struggling to have space, and so is the owl. The owl's prey is the mice, so it's struggling to eat them, whereas the mice are struggling to not be eaten and to find food. Thinking about fitness in this regard, what trait would make a mouse fit? What trait would help one of these mice survive in this environment? Well, hopefully you picked up on having black fur. If you have black fur, you blend in. That helps you survive. But that is, does that have anything to do with their fitness? No, not at all. It just means in this specific environment, they, by their variation, ended up with something that helped them survive. If the color of the ground were changed to brown, it would become a completely different story on what is fit. When a species inherits a characteristic that can help them survive, this is what we mean by adaptation. Too often I hear students say a species adapted in their lifetime. That is not possible. You cannot adapt in your lifetime, but you can inherit an adaptation. For example, the offspring of the black mice in this population are inheriting the adaptation of black fur. So if a species has high fitness, more likely to survive in its environment, then it is more likely to also have offspring. If it's less fit, it is a trait that doesn't help it survive, like light brown fur in this case, then it's less likely to survive unless it inherits an adaptation. This sometimes is called survival of the fittest. Darwin himself didn't use that term, but it explains this idea that all of life is in a struggle for existence. Some individuals have fit traits, some don't. Those that survive have those fit traits, so they are the ones that win in the survival of the fittest. Here you can just see that process over multiple generations. If a ground happens to be black, you can see a population of black fur and tan fur. Where did that variation come from? Meiosis, all species have natural diversity. Here, nature, in the instance of a predatory bird, is going to come in and eat whatever is easiest to find, the light brown mice. This is causing the black fur trait to be fit. So the black mice reproduce at a higher frequency than the light brown, and you see an overall change in the frequency of traits over time. Why was there such diversity in the mice to begin with? Well, there's meiosis. Every generation that sexually reproduces ends up with diverse offspring. And there's also mutation. Mutation is always occurring from replication errors. Because of this diversity pool that's constantly occurring, we have the concept of descent with modification. Every living species has descended from another individual or another species with changes. Diversity with meiosis, DNA replication errors, and mutation happens all the time. Life can only come from life, so every generation is anew with a slight change from the previous. So putting this all together, here is our definition of natural selection, again argued by Darwin and on the origin of species. Natural forces, genetics, the environment, predators are selecting for fit traits that increase the chances an organism survives and reproduces. The farmers were doing this with cows. They were also doing this with vegetables. But instead of a human selecting the traits, nature is all the time. But the thing with nature is nature is always changing. The shape of the earth itself, populations of predators, global temperatures. Because of that, species are dynamically being selected for survival. Now, because of this, something called common descent is implied. Specifically, that all living things descended from a common ancestor. 
that if you go far enough back in Darwin's tree, you'll find an ancestral species from which all other living things descended from with changes. This is a big claim. Think what kind of evidence will be needed to support common descent, to show that all living things descended with changes. Well, the classic acronym for the most common evidence for evolution is FAME. Fossils, anatomical structures, molecular evidence, and embryological evidence. These four primary lines of evidence succinctly prove common descent and common ancestry. Let's go through each one. With evidence from fossils, fossils can reveal a lot. They can show what kind of organisms lived in the past, and we can compare that to species that are currently extant, that currently exist, to see how they are shared or different over time. It can also give us insight into what kinds of things that organism ate based on their jaw or mouth parts or their hands, how they moved, and what the climate they came from was like. There are specific references we can make with fossils. One is, are there structures that are similarly shared between different species? If so, that suggests that they have a common ancestor. We call these structures homologous structures, and you can see that here. I have the bones of a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. They're all homologous. They all have a humerus, a radius, an ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. That shared structure, even though each one's a little different, it's following the same pattern. This strongly suggests that they share a common ancestor, that they've evolved from a shared individual. Another kind of reference that can be done is something called a vestigial structure. These are structures that used to have a purpose in an ancestral species, but no longer have a purpose in the species that currently exist. For example, do you know that whales have hip bones? They do. Whales have a pelvis and a femur. Now think about that. Pelvis and a femur, that attaches to a leg. That's used to walk. Whales don't walk. Interesting. Whales actually descended from land walking mammals. The closest living relative would be a uh, close living relative would be something close to a hippo, a land mammal that is usually saturated in water. It takes a long time for traits to go away in a species, and this pelvis and femur here are a relic of what the ancestors used. That's what we mean by vestigial. And there are also structures that ha appear similar in function but have different structures. For example, if you look at an insect wing, a dinosaur wing, a bird wing, or a bat wing, some of them are membranous, some of them have bones, some have skin, some have feathers, totally different structures. They're not homologous, but they're all used for the same thing, flight. What this suggests from an evolutionary standpoint is these species evolved in a similar environment, needing to fly, but they do not share any recent common ancestry. They don't have any shared bone structure. Looking at molecules, a lot of meaningful comparisons can be made to see if two living organisms are closely related or distantly related. One is by looking at the amino acid sequence in a molecule they share. This is oftentimes done with hemoglobin, the primary protein in blood cells, or with something called cytochrome C, one of the many proteins in the mitochondria for cellular respiration. If you compare the protein sequence among species, you can look for the number of differences between that sequence. The more differences there are, the more distant those species are. Mutations and changes have occurred in different directions. The fewer changes, the more closely related they are. You can also look at DNA sequences. Fewer changes, closer they are. More changes, further away they are. And you can look at early embryological development. Here you can see the image of a chicken embryo and a human embryo, a bird and a mammal look pretty similar. They both have eyes, they both have pharyngeal pouches, and they both have a tail. I'm pretty sure you don't think you have pharyngeal pouches or gills or a tail anymore. Interesting. Having similar embryological development shows, again, shared common ancestry. They're coming from a common ancestor, and that's why these traits are shared. I hope this was a helpful introduction to evolution by natural selection. We went through the theory itself and looked at a little bit of the evidence that supports it. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.